I'm Donna Everhart, and this is the story behind my story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey. Dr. O. Robin Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Donna Everhart. Welcome to Author Stories. Find archives of all the shows at hankgarner.com, and while you're there, never miss an episode by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube. It's free on all platforms. As we get into today's show, I'd like to tell you guys about some incredible new releases that I know you're going to love. The brand new book from Nathan Heistad, Rift, The Resistance, Book One. They've watched us for centuries through the rift. They prepared. Invasion is inevitable. The Earth fleet has known of the Watchers for years, unwilling to share the knowledge with humanity. Now it might be too late. Hidden away from the fleet, one man is creating a new colony ship destined for the other side of the rift, but he's missing a few pieces. Three other people have varied paths to get there. Ace goes from the streets of Earth to the fleet training facility on the moon. Flint, an ex-fleet pilot, must decide if a job is worth his life. And Wren, imprisoned for a secret project years ago, is given hope as an unlikely ally, whispers words of escape in her ear. Their journeys lead to Councilman Jarden Fairbanks, who knows of the impending invasion and has prepared. All they can do is wait for the rift to open once again and see what's on the other side. Rift joins an ensemble cast facing immeasurable obstacles. If you enjoy space battles, prison breaks, androids, and aliens, buried under a shroud of mystery, this book is for you. Try it today. A fresh new fiction adventure from the author of the best-selling Survivor series. Rift, The Resistance, Book 1. Now available. There's a link in the show notes. Till Death in the entire Rockwell Returns Files series is now available from Audible.com. A laugh-out-loud communist-punching adventure. Sam Rockwell came home from the Second World War to work as a fledgling private investigator specializing in helping returns. Recently deceased ghosts who've come back with unfinished business. Check out this audiobook clip from book one of the Rockwell Return Files series from author Jason Onspach. Unbelievable. Alice entered the dining room and saw her husband standing with his coat draped over his arm, his hat still resting on his head. Take your hat off, Frank. Now, about the pot roast. Frank pulled his hat tightly to his head, slightly twisting it in defiance. He saw on the table an alien supper, seeking his approval from white china. With hands rooted to his hips, he lifted a desolate face to Alice. No pot roast, he whimpered. I'm sorry, it's just that Colette Peterson... No pot roast even, he exploded. A man like me never catches a break. I tell you the nerve of some people. You're being unreasonable, dear. We can have pot roast tomorrow night. Not you, them, or him. However many it was. An unbowling and pot roast night. Frank circled a finger in the air for emphasis. That's what really steams me. You're not making any sense. What happened, dear? Alice asked, crossing the room toward her gesticulating husband. What happened? Frank echoed his face red from the effort. The worst day of my life, that's what happened. Oh, darling. Alice closed the gap between herself and her husband and felt a matrimonial pull to rest her hand and head on Frank's chest, something that always seemed to soothe him. Her eyes widened in surprise as her hand passed through his body, like a wind through fog. Frank? Alice yelped with a backward jerk, hastily removing her hand from the chill miasma. Did you die today? It is, Frank said, removing his hat to bring it slowly to his bosom, as you say. In reverence for his now past life, he screwed his head slightly up into his right, staring into the heavens. Alice took another step back as Frank held his pose. It was an exact imitation of a statue he once saw of Admiral Porter. Frank felt resplendent with somber and regal airs. He waited for the sobbing to begin. You look ridiculous, Alice said dismissively. 
Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Donna Everhart on the show with me today. Donna has a brand new book uh, that is out today. You guys are really going to love it. The Forgiving Kind is out today everywhere, and uh, this book is fantastic. You guys are really going to love it. Welcome to the show, Donna. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm super excited to have you, Donna. Um, you have an accent kind of like mine, and uh, I love having Southern writers on the show. There's uh, there's something special uh, about you guys. So uh, welcome to the show. Thank you again. I, I do have an accent. I will have a, <laughs> a stuffy accent. Well, well, that's mine. My, my accent comes out more when I can't breathe, so <laughs> it's that's harder true. to control it. Um, Donna, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? You know, that's a, I love that question. I actually do. Um, I can't actually profess to being the sort of writer that knew from the time she could read, for instance, you know, back when I was about six, seven years old learning to read. Um, I might be aging myself a little bit by admitting that because nowadays kids read a lot earlier, but in my case, I didn't start reading until I was in first grade, but I certainly had an avid, uh, curiosity about it. And once I understood that the little black squiggly lines that form letters and letters formed words and those words could tell a story, that was it for me. I became this voracious reader. Um, but for the writing part of it, it came a little bit later. I was probably about 18 years old. Um, and at the time, it, it did not become this full fledged, I have got to write. I want to write. It's what I want to do until some years later. But the very first inkling was back when I was about 18 years old. And I had no idea at that time what I would write. Um, I was actually sort of leaning towards children's stories back then, but it was truly like just, you know, dabbling in it and then putting stuff aside and I wouldn't touch it for two or three years. <laughs> mm. What what kind of books did you uh, love to read? Oh, good grief. Let's see. I, I sort of went through these stages um, in my in my earliest uh, memory, some of the big books for me were Laura Ingalls Wilder, um, a lot of Jack London, and I'm talking about when I was in grade school. There were the books like uh, The Black Stallion, My Friend Flicka, uh, and then I eventually moved on to when I was probably a tween, as they would call it today. I moved on to uh, James Harriet, read all those books, All Creatures Great and Small, you know, that whole series there. I moved on to The Hobbit, sort of got into the fantasy books a little bit. Eventually ended up with Harlequin Romance, you know, I was in my teens. I started getting into the romance stuff, and um, eventually I landed on Stephen King. And I read a lot of Stephen King for... I would say like a decade. I, I still have about 30 something of his books upstairs, but you can see what I'm saying. I sort of, you know, sure. yeah, jumping around in genres. And I, at one point, probably in between my Harlequin romance stage and the Stephen King stage, I was big, big into historic fiction. And I've got uh, some paperbacks upstairs that are very dated. I want to say they're probably like, 40 years old. There's one in particular. I posted a picture of it out on the internet the other day. Um, that's called Sacagawea. And that, that book is probably 1400 pages uh, in length. And so I was reading these huge sweeping sagas of historic fiction. And, and then again, like I said, I ended up with Stephen King. But the funny part is, um, I was not familiar with Southern fiction until probably in the early 90s. And I don't know how I landed on Kay Gibbons. But once I read Kay Gibbons' first, well, I don't know if it was her first book, but it was Ellen Foster. Uh, that yeah. was it for me. That She is like my literary hero, her and Dorothy Allison. They were the impetus, really, for um, what turned from a reading habit into me becoming a writer. It, what's really funny to me um, is that Southern fiction has its own 
designation. Uh, it, you talk about Stephen King, and you know one thing that I love about Stephen King is the way he world builds, and uh, uh, you know a lot of his stories are set in Derry, and he they have this real New England feel, and. Um, uh, th- the thing I really love about his stuff is that a lot of times he tells stories about just regular people in this little town, and, and then you know stuff goes horribly wrong. Um, but you know you really get to know these characters and the setting and this place. Um, but you would never call his writing New England fiction, um, you, you know, or, or northeastern fiction. It's just not. Um, but yet southern fiction gets its own kind of designation. Uh, why do you think that is, and what is it about southern fiction? That makes it southern, other than just the place. Well, th- that's that's actually a really good question, um, and I've heard it before. And I think for me, and it's kind of interesting because I answered a very similar question here recently. It's it's I could probably wax and wane about this a little bit, but for southern fiction, for it to be on its own, like you just described, which is perfect. And I don't know that I've ever heard anybody else really kind of come to it and point out, Hey, you know, we don't have Northern fiction or Northeast fiction. Um, it's about, I think it's about the fact that, um, and I know Stephen King is from Maine, you know, and that's where he lives and that's where he sort of settles all of his stories. Um, so, but you, you do hear that a lot that Southern fiction has to be, written by somebody who is from the South and it's a story about the South and there, there's the language of the South and there's all the nuances of the South. And I'm talking aside from language, you know, the food. And this is one thing to me, you know, that's kind of interesting. And it, you know, it doesn't, it, it goes without saying it's, you know, not just for the South itself. You could say the same thing about up North, you know, they like gravy on their French fries. I've never heard of such, but <laughs> you know, I know that they like that. And so you could have a scene where somebody's eating gravy on their French fries and somebody might automatically know, Oh, Hey, that's a story from, from up North. But I, I guarantee you, you know, anybody that sits down and starts reading a book and the book might say, uh, there might be a sentence in there that says she was eating grits with red eye gravy in a booth at, Waffle House or something like that. You know what I mean? It's, right. it's about the grits and the red eye gravy. But, you know, again, for a story to be considered Southern fiction, it's, it's, it's a lot about the family dynamics. Um, you know, mama, daddy, um, and then the extended family, you know, that comes into play. It's about the rural scenery, I think, you know, uh, down here, the North is considered, I think, industrial. And the South has always, in my mind, been considered um, more agricultural. And that's a challenging sort of lifestyle, no matter how you slice it. All work is hard. I mean, you know, it's not easy to go up, you know, like maybe in Pittsburgh or something and work in a steel plant. It's not easy to go over into West Virginia and work in the coal, coal mine. You know, we know that. Um, but there's just something about a cotton field. There's a lot of history, of course, that we know of about cotton, you know, and the role that it has played in the South's history, um, which goes back to, uh, again, I think, too, part of the reason why when we think of Southern fiction, it's a lot about our history as well. You know, we've got that very deep and um challenging history behind us as well. Uh, what did you what did you study in college? I have a Bachelor of Science in Business Management, which has nothing to do with what I do now. You know, it's sort of like go to college, you know, and you get um, your degree. And I actually didn't get that degree till late in life. Uh, what I spent a lot of time doing was um, information technology. So I was a IT cubicle rat, as I like to say, for about, well, a total of about 35 years. And 25 of those years were spent at a company called Nortel. I don't know if you're familiar with Nortel. Yeah. So, yeah, everybody, you know, that I bring up, hey, Nortel, oh, yeah, I know somebody that worked there. They were a huge <laughs> company at one time, 95,000 people, and we were sp- spread out globally. Um so I was with them until 2012, you know, from like 1987 to 2012. 
Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> looking back now, uh, and, and we're going to get more into your transition to writing in just a minute, but um, that that time that you spent uh, working at Nortel and, and IT and, and, and that side of the world, um, do you feel like that that has affected your writing um, in any way? Do you – is there any sort of connection there for you uh, that you that you can look back and say this time in my life uh, gave me this skill or gave me this insight? I would have to say that the one thing that I know about myself is that I'm um, persistent and I don't like to give up much on anything. And I was like that with my job and I like challenges and I like to be challenged. And I also like working under a deadline. That's how I'm best motivated to work is by deadline. And I think um, I did a lot of um, towards the end. I was doing a lot of work at home. And that takes a lot of self-discipline to sit down every day and put in those hours for a company. I mean, a lot of people, you know, hey, I'm at home. I watch TV, go out to the pool, you know, <laughs> stuff right. like that. Uh, and I couldn't do it. You know, I just uh, that was not me, if anything. And this was said a lot about people that telecommuted or work from home, that what they found is that they tended to put in more hours than their counterparts who were, you know, not this wasn't the case for everybody, obviously, but would put in more hours. I was one of those people. I mean, I could not. I had my office upstairs. I had a computer upstairs. I had what they called an IP phone and uh, internet protocol phone upstairs. And I, the first thing I would do before I even went downstairs to get a cup of coffee was when I got up, I went to check my emails. And that was like at 530, 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, whereas most people who are commuting into work, well, they're not going to check their emails until they actually get into the office, say, around right. 8, 8 o'clock. And then I would, you know, get coffee or whatever, but I would, I was, it was like, I was tied to that computer. I mean, I would easily, easily put in 50 hours a week working at home. Um, but it, it, I think if I had to say that my job um, before writing gave me any sort of uh, talent or discipline or whatever, it was just about, you know, that ability to have the, you know, the fortitude or whatever you want to call it, to sit down and push through until it was completed. And that really is uh, maybe kind of the most underappreciated skill uh, for writers is just showing up and doing the work. Um, you know, we can we can talk all about tools and and all of the things that, that help us do what we do. But but, you know, if you kind of don't put your backside in the chair, uh, the writing doesn't get done. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, so what was the uh, the spark of lightning, if you will, or the impetus that that brought writing uh, back to your life? What what was it? So you're, you're working Nortel. You've got uh, you know this this amazing job that you're doing. How did storytelling come back to you? I was actually working on a novel, uh, off and on. It's kind of funny. <laughs> I sort of joke about this. Um, something would happen at work that didn't make me very happy. And I'd be, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to write that book, you know, I'm going to quit. <laughs> and uh, so I was actually writing, um, believe it or not, The Education of Dixie Dupree, which was my debut novel um, that came out in October of 2016. And I had remnants of that book on my desktop for, gosh, I don't know, from the time I read Ellen Foster, maybe, you know, wow. I mean, 15 years. And, and for a long time, it existed as this. And I remember exactly how many pages I had at the time, 87 pages that I would pull out and nitpick at. And then everything would smooth out at work. I'd put it up. You know, I wouldn't even think about it. I mean, I can remember putting it up and not touching it for a year at a time. And so what ended up happening, and it was sort of, you know, I, I often think today, if Nortel had not gone bankrupt, which is what happened, um, where would I be today? Would I have been published? Would I have finished the book? Would I have even been published? You know, 
I almost don't even want to think about that sometimes because I fully envisioned that I would retire from Nortel. And, you know, I mean, it was a great company to work for. I love the people there. I liked the job that I was doing. Um, but they, they declared bankruptcy. And I told my husband, I said, if I'm going to do anything about the writing, now is the time. And actually, that's when I went back to school. And so if you can imagine what this schedule must have been like, starting in, let's see, I think it was 2009 towards, yeah, beginning of 2009, I ended up uh, attending Western Governors University, which is an online university. It's accredited. Um, you can see all this kind of stuff nowadays. I mean, they've got so many of these online universities, but it was... Um, literally sort of like at the leading, bleeding edge of learning how to do this online type of schooling. Uh, a lot of a lot of standard brick and mortar universities offer it nowadays. You know, this is the way that a lot of students get their classes in. Um, so they were probably groundbreaking some of that technology back then. But anyway, I went back to school and I also told him, aside from getting my degree, what I want to do is see if anything can happen with the writing. So what I was doing for about three years was working my full-time job at Nortel because even though they had declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy, it took them years to sell off the different divisions and to transition all of the systems over to these various companies. And, of course, they were having to work with them in the background to do that uh, system transition, and I was in there, you know, doing, um, I used to do technical project management, and I wasn't doing any of that at the time. I was doing more of headcount analysis and uh, departmental financials, and I have to say that the pressure was amping up while I was doing that because there were less layers between somebody like me and the CIO, and so it was a very high-pressure thing to be in, not only because of the bankruptcy activities going on, but just, you know, due to that sheer fact. I mean, there used to be like five levels between us, and then there were suddenly just two or three, so the pressure was there. But I also turned to the book, you know, so I'm working full-time, I'm going to school full-time, and if I had any gas left in the tank, I pulled the book out and I started working on it. And uh, so literally that was the impetus for me to pursue writing was the fact that my company went Chapter 11. And I just, I, it had been there all the time for all those years nagging at me. And I finally just decided to do something. There's uh, these amazing gifts uh, that come to us sometimes in the guise of tragedy or the guise of, of bad news. And uh, it, it's you know, hindsight is such a beautiful thing because you can't always see these, uh, these things coming. Um, but so many stories have come out of, you know, a, a something that, that you think is, um, uh, you know, that, that is, uh, that is bad news. And then if you could only see into the future and see that that was going to be such a gift, you know, of something that you, you couldn't even imagine. Um, I, I love those kind of stories. Um, tell me, if you will, um, about, uh, about Dixie Dupree and that story that you had been working on for a long time. Um, did, did Dixie come to you first? Did, was there a, a, a scenario that came like when, when a story starts unfolding for you? Um, how does it usually come to you? And, and then tell me about Dixie. Who is she? That, that's a really good question. Um, so Dixie Dupree, it's, it, this is kind of interesting to me, too, because a lot of people say, how many books did you write before you wrote Dixie Dupree? Dixie Dupree is literally my very first book. I mean, I was, like I said, nitpicking at it for you know, 10, 12 years. Um, and Dixie Dupree, to me, is a... When I talked about the other two writers, Dorothy Allison, she wrote Bastard out of Carolina. And I talked about Kay Gibbons uh, writing Ellen Foster. And when I read those two stories, they had such a huge impact on me as a reader that it just became this um, 
desire, this want to write something like that. Although I felt like I could write it while being somewhat similar, very different. And by that, I mean, I sort of went where maybe some writers would not go or would not want to go, and that is writing the story very graphically. So Dixie Dupree is this 11-year-old girl uh, living in Perry County, Alabama, and people have asked, well, why did you choose that location when you're from North Carolina? And they're, in my opinion, because I knew how this story was going to play out, I wanted that degree of separation from people thinking that Dixie was me. Right. And while some of the things that took place in Dixie's life happened with me, it did not get to that level um, that it got with her. And so this is a story of a young girl, like I said, 11 years old. It's told from her point of view, first person point of view. She has a very distinctive voice. The voice has been compared to Bone in Bastard Out of Carolina. And of course, Ellen, uh, or not Ellen and Ellen, uh, Ellen Foster, but um, uh, Sue Monk Kids, The Secret Life of Thieves, Lily, and uh, her character there. So those two voices were used to sort of describe the distinctiveness of Dixie Dupree's voice. And what was interesting about writing that is um, her voice and the way I wrote it. The, her reactions to certain things are like my reactions. And um, and I tried, despite the heaviness of the story and the toughness of that story, I also tried to make her humorous, you know, because you've got to lighten it up sometimes. Um, but she's dealing with a mother who was depressed a father who was alcoholic, um, and there's uh, an aunt, you know, that she is able to get some understanding from, um, and there's, anyway, there's just this whole situation uh, happening between the mother and the father, and Dixie recognizes, you know, that what she thought was a happy life is really not a happy life, and uh, there's, uh, without giving away too much about the book, there's a tragedy that happens, and her Uncle Ray comes down to visit. And a lot of people are prepared for Uncle Ray and what takes place between Dixie and Uncle Ray because I sort of foreshadow that very well in the very, really the very first line of the book, which essentially Dixie does a lot of her um, heart-to-heart talks with herself in her diary. And the very first line of that book states that her diary was used as key evidence against Uncle Ray. Mm. And so that sort of sets a reader up for, okay, well, at some point Uncle Ray is going to show up and things are not going to be as great as as you would think, given what he was offering to do, which was to help them. But he, he really did not help them very much at all. Right. Um the the using the the device of the the journal or the diary um it is a great way to um to convey things to the reader without just info dumping um what did what did that offer you um in telling dixie's story um did it allow you to uh to get her more honest um uh, thoughts uh, more so than you could get in a first person narrative. Uh, maybe, uh, what do you think having the diary uh, gave you as a storyteller? Well, uh, one of the key things that Dixie has said or did say in, in the story is you can't lie to yourself. And that's true. You know, if you're really going to use your diary as it, the way a lot of people use it. And I used to have a diary when I was growing up. And I, I don't do it now. You know, a lot of people talk about it as journaling nowadays. It's, it's called journaling. And I don't do that, um, but I used to. And for Dixie, it was all about how you can't lie to yourself. And she really did. She was pretty brutally honest in her first-person narrative. But then she would also write down these extra little thoughts, you know, like at the end of a day where if a certain incident had happened, um, 
it's you're sort of pointing it out you know it was like a, a, a great device or a great tool to be able to use to give that reader that little bit of extra insight into what Dixie was thinking about a particular situation where I didn't have to try to um, it, it was a good way I, I closed each chapter with a diary entry and so it would sort of it would sort of in a way bring about all of the events that had taken place in that particular chapter and give give the reader that one single final thought about what Dixie felt about what had taken place. And so it was just kind of a real good and you know unique way to to tie up all of the events that may have happened in a chapter, especially the troubling ones. Um, your fiction has been described uh, not just as Southern fiction, but gritty Southern fiction. Um, h- how important is it to you to um, to not only get the place and the tone uh, of the South, but also the the hardship and the um, the the things that you start seeing when you scratch below the surface and and realizing that that idyllic settings are not always idyllic and it, and it comes with every region and every you know people group um but you know there's a there's a, a tendency to whitewash things and to to gloss over uh things how important is it to you to to scratch past that and get down to the real um human stories uh, that's that's actually key for me. I I don't like um I tend to not like <laughs> I like to I guess I like to read what I'm writing. And and I think for me I absolutely thrive in a you know, maybe that's gonna sound kinda strange to some people, <laughs> on, you know, a a tough story. It's it's what I like to read. It's actually what I like to watch, you know, on T V, same thing. Um where people are thrown up against what seem like insurmountable odds, and yet they're able to come out on the other side of it in some positive way. It, it's a learning experience. They grow from it. Um, and I think that's actually, you know, part and parcel when we were talking about Southern fiction in of itself. You know, we, we all know that um, there's a lot of struggles out there uh, with a lot of, uh, people that live all over this country, and um, in particular, you know, I think for the South with our history, you know, that that's really kind of part and parcel of it, too. We have a lot of pride down here uh, as well in our history, and I know you know this very well. You're in sure. Mississippi. Um, you know, but there's that sense of pride, you know, no matter what our past was, um, I feel like I have to look at it like, the, some things happened, you know, and the and, and nowadays, you know, the way we look at these things, it's like, oh, gosh, you know, can't believe some of that stuff happened, but it did. Right. And unless you're going to tell it like it is and like it was, and see, that's another thing, too, is I, I like to write about um, the time frames that are sort of there, you know, my books don't take place today, current times, contemporary times, it, it's usually the 40s, 50s, 60s. That's where all my stories have taken place so far. And that's, you know, right. Some of it, of course, is during that calm time, you know, where there's really nothing happening. But for us here in the South, even though we, you know, the United States itself, say, may not have been in a war, we were, as a people, you know, as a culture, we were having our own issues down here, obviously, with segregation, you know, and, and things like that. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's all of that. And I actually believe that is what sort of drives the whole thing with Southern fiction sometimes is our history. And it's, and it's a gritty history. I mean, you know, we have to look at, you know, again, some of the things that have taken place in the past and, and that's what I like to write about. I like to write about, um, you know, not, not just the family dynamic, you know, which can be. Um, potentially the only thing, you know, with the story that's going on, like in Dixie Dupree, there was nothing in there, you know, that was really about our history. It was just other than the fact of maybe how, you know, husbands and wives sort of treated each other back then. Um, but 
um, in particular, for instance, with the forgiving kind, I do uh, point out a little bit of that bigotry and um, the racial things that were going on at, at that time. Well, let's talk about The Forgiving Kind. It's your brand new book. It's out today uh, everywhere. Um, this is a fantastic story. Um, it reminds me um, a lot of of some of the stories that I heard growing up. Uh, and you've got this this great character of Sonny Creech. Um, it, and uh, Sonny uh, is a water witch. And my, my grandfather – uh, could divine water, and uh, he was, uh, you know, during the Great Depression and stuff. Uh, people would come to his house and 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 pick him up and go to to new land where they were going to build a house, and and he could tell them exactly where to dig the well and and how deep. And, and I hear stories of people all the time that talk about my grandfather and that. Um, wh- who is who is Sonny? What where did the story come from? And and tell us about the the unique situation that this book finds us in. I'll tell you what, um, out of all the books I've written, this, of course, is my third one um, that's coming out. Uh, I've written a total of five. But um, Sunny, Sunny Creech, I, I guess to answer the question just straight up, I'm really just writing a story here about this, like what I said earlier, about what I like to read about and what I like to watch on TV. And there was this movie that came out and I won't be able to remember the name of it right offhand. Um, but for some reason, this movie has always stuck with me. And I've always said to myself, I want to write about a family who's growing cotton and they're, ha- they, they end up, of course, you know, there's going to be some kind of a, uh, a struggle. Uh, and I, at the time I was trying to put the story together, I didn't know what that struggle would be. But it had the movie had Sally Field in it. Do you remember that? Um, and there was a bank note on the farm or something like that. I do. I, I don't. I don't oh, remember you, the name, but I, I do. I do know the story you're talking about. I absolutely loved it. You know, and and it came out. I want to say like about twenty or thirty years ago, but it, it really stuck with me. So you know, it's kind of interesting because. Um, with Dixie Dupree, Dixie Dupree was just me really kind of sitting down and hoping that I could write a story that would be as impactful as Bastard Out of Carolina or Ellen Foster. And then uh, with the second book, The Road to Bittersweet, that was really more of a historic fiction novel, but it's, of course, Southern, based in the Appalachian Mountains. And that was more about me wanting to just try to write about uh, the, that 1940s historic flood that took place in the western mountains of North Carolina it had to do with my husband and I taking a hike and we saw this very remote cabin that was the uh, one of the only surviving cabins in a 1916 flood which was also another historic flood and then here comes the forgiving kind and I knew I was going to get asked this question about well you know what is this story? Why did you write this story? And, you know, how did you come up with this? And it, and it truly is simply the fact of, um, it's the kind of story that I want to read. It's, and I'm hoping other people will want to read, obviously. Yeah. Well, well you know, you, you can't discount that, that, um, you can come up with all sorts of ideas, but if you're not passionate about it as the writer, um, then that passion is not going to translate to the reader. Uh, it's got to be something that, that, that kind of the story that needs to come out of you. That's exactly right. And, and I've always had a fascination. I tend to include elements of things that fascinate me. And for instance, in um, The Road to Bittersweet, I've always been fascinated with the people who back in those times were considered an idiot savant. And today they would be considered an autistic savant. And of course, the main character in that book has an older sister who is an autistic savant. And so that was, you know, kind of the reason why I would include something like that. And in The Forgiving Kind, I've absolutely been fascinated with the ability to be able to divine water. I mean, I did a lot of research on this, and some people consider it a pseudoscience, and I have to say that I throw my hat towards the people that believe it and I believe it and I think there are people who are intuitive like that and sensitive like that and so through the course of writing the book and I wanted to get it right I wanted um, 
for Sunny Creech, who already has this rooted sort of connection to the land, similar to her father. This, she's a 12-year-old girl. Um, you know, she has this um, very different way of thinking about their property, a 300-acre cotton farm. Um, unlike her two older brothers who, you know, Ross is the oldest one and he's a lot like his father in the fact that he's practical and he's going to get the job done. Um, and then there's the middle child, uh, her uh, next, he's older than her too, but he's the middle child. He's 14. Trent, he can't stand it. He hates it. And then there's Sonny. Sonny is the only one like her father that has this passion for it. And I don't really, you know, in my mind, I didn't need to explain where that came from. There are just some people that are born, you know, to want to do that. Right. And then I thought, you know, it would be just, it would really just tie her more so to that love for her to actually, when I talk about her being rooted to the ground, that's where the divining water comes in. I mean, she walks that land. And she's got that willow branch in her hand. And that's why I wrote those scenes like I did, where she actually could feel, you know, something coming up through her legs, that bareness that she sort of describes. Those scenes were, I mean, I, I love writing them. I wish I could have put more of that in there. Right. <laughs> Well, we know we can't have a story where everything is wonderful and Sunny just has this, you know, almost magical power and everything goes right for her in the world. Um, what, what's the conflict for Sunny and, uh, and, and how do we as readers get to, um, get to root for her? Yeah, there's, um, in a way I was sort of revisiting, um, this, this, uh, ability or, or this way that I want to be able to bring in an, an antagonist, sort of like the way I had in Dixie Dupree, where, I mean, back in those times, you know, this story is set in 1955. It's in Jones County, North Carolina, and the little town that they're close to is called Flatland, which is a fictitious town, but it's so, you know, she describes it as so flat out there. Um which, of course, is perfect uh, for doing what they're doing. Um, you know, at the very beginning of the book, I think it's by page five or six, there's um, an event that happens that brings great heartache and tragedy to the family. And uh, they have a next-door neighbor who has been fairly reclusive. Sonny met him uh, once back when she was nine years old, and she went with her father over to this man's property. His name is Frank Fowler. And um, he's been he's very rich. His farm is much bigger than theirs. Um, but he's been fairly reclusive to them. And uh, that one time that she met him, you know, she just didn't care for him at all. But he shows up. And um, after this tragedy has taken place and he offers to help them. And, you know, Sonny has misgivings right away, just given the fact that she's already encountered him that one time back when she was nine years old. And it's just sort of her gut instinct, you know, that there's, she doesn't like the things that he has said to her. She, he's, he's very odd to her. His mannerisms are odd. He's not like most of the men that she knows, like her daddy, you know, just uh, a hardworking man, you know, wears coveralls and that's who he is. And Frank Fowler is just somebody very different to her. Um, and of course he is going to be the one that is going to create, um, this, uh, very different world for her that she is not used to her and her best friend, Daniel. Excellent. Well, the book is out now. Um, we won't give too much away. We want people to go grab a copy of the forgiving kind. Um, this book is amazing. I love everything that you're doing. Uh, Donna, um, if people are just learning about you and your work, uh, is there a place online where they could connect with you? Maybe dig into your back catalog and, and learn more about what, uh, about you and what made of motivates you and, and maybe new news coming up. Oh, absolutely. Um, I have a website, and what I love about the website is it's got the connections to all of my social media accounts, like I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, 
Um, I'm actually going through an update on that website. There's some things currently going on with it because I'm also on Instagram. So I'm trying to get my web developer guy to get all of those quick and easy links uh, up at the top of my banner on my homepage. But the website is www.donnaeberhart.com. And I do a blog post. Um, what I've been wrapped up in the past few weeks, matter of fact, is uh, The Forgiving Kind has got 34 chapters in it. And I've been doing something called First Sentence Fridays. For all four, uh, 34 of those chapters that I'm actually coming up on. Oh, fun. 33 this week. So it's about over with, but I do try to get out there and do regular blog posts and I have an event page. And I love that. I, I yeah. love when, I love when authors give us a, a, a deeper glimpse into what's going on. I absolutely love that. That's fantastic. Uh, Donna, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. We're going to send everybody to come see you and to pick up their copy of The Forgiven Kind. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on with me today. I really appreciate you having me. I enjoyed the conversation a lot. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to HankGarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleave's The Jason Crane Series. The ancient building wore the severe cassock colors of a Puritan minister, a uniform monochrome of slate-gray shingles and soot-gray clabberts. Its shadowed upper windows cross-hatched like the facets of a spider's eye. The second story protruded beyond the first and bore the house's only ornament, two gray teardrops of wood weeping from each corner of the building's stiff upper lip. The place would have looked sinister and foreboding in its shadowed alley if not for the die-cut silhouette of a dancing sheep, jaunty above the door, and the two front bay windows that blazed with colorful, welcoming light. The windows were hung with orbs of colored glass on staggered lengths of ribbon. Each orb glowed with autumnal reds and delicate greens, burgundy tints and pumpkin hues, dappled raspberry and clover lime, streaked with light and weightless as bubbles over a cauldron. The shelves below offered crystal skulls and silver daggers and horny devils, Celtic chalices and woven dream catchers in dreamcoat hues. A primitive broom leaned in a corner, ready for flight, and a rhapsodic nude in bronze clutched her goat-legged lover beneath a jackal bust of Anubis. The interior of the shop was even witchier. Above a crude and sooty fireplace, a stack of brick barely holding the shape of a chimney pushed through the barn-high roof, threading ancient beams that crisscrossed overhead. Brooms and kettles and Christmas lights dangled from these, alongside Halloween costumes and Chinese umbrellas, pointy hats and bundles of herbs. Jason wandered deeper into the shop. His fingers trailed across strange bronze statuary and Aztec masks of turquoise and lapis lazuli. He rolled his eyes at the luck candles and money charms, but goggled indecently at a nude and anatomically correct silver nymph with long golden hair that reminded him of Kate. See anything you like? Jason jumped, turned, and jumped again. The woman standing before him was the living embodiment of every hippy-dippy counterculture type he'd ever seen. Her hair was green, her face pale and round, her doughy body wrapped in some elaborately woven ethnic garb. Her eyebrows were black and pierced in little rows, and her eyes were heavily circled with midnight blue, as if she'd been sucker-punched by an oil slick. She tapped the glass over the nymph. Admiring the goddess, I see. Oh, uh... Um, she practically caught him with porn. You want to hold her? She won't break. Here. The woman flipped open a glass door and handed Jason the naked figure. See how heavy she is? You could bang her against the wall all day and barely make a dent. She waggled her eyebrows, obviously enjoying his discomfort. He checked the price tag. Seven hundred bucks? The goddess is a symbol of love and fertility. Don't be ashamed of desiring her. The woman's long green fingernails plucked a long black cigarette from a long red case, and she lit it. I sense, she blew smoke and studied its whirls. Dissatisfaction in love, yes? 
I have just the thing. She pulled Jason into a side room where the smell of her clove smoke gave way to the skunky aromas of potpourri sachets, tea leaves, and hanging clutches of twiggy flowers. She searched, found a little bundle, and pressed it into his hand. This will make you irresistible. Rub it on your nethers twice a day, and love shall surely find you. Jason made a face. The bundle smelled like cow manure. He didn't even want that on his hands. 